Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of The Faces of Business, where I talk with interesting people sharing life and business experiences to entertain, engage, build community, and provide information to help others succeed. If you're interested in learning more about one of our guests or how we are helping business owners generate wealth and build businesses they can sell or succeed at Exit Your Way, you can find more information on our website, ExitYourWay.com or by contacting me directly, Damon, at ExitYourWay.com. I hope you enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Welcome once again to Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pistolka, and wow, am I excited for our guest today. We got Mark Scramenti here today. We're going to be talking about Vivid Path. We are going to be talking about breaking through pat plateaus to grow your business. Mark, thanks for being here today. You're welcome, Damon. It's great to see you. I always love talking to you, and I'm excited to talk about this today. Oh, man, we're going to have some fun because you, you have incredible experience, incredible <laughs> e-commerce experience, other various background experience. It's just so fun to talk to you because you've been there. That's the thing that I really enjoy talking with you, Mark. And you, you had to work these businesses through these plateaus. And that's why I think it's going to be really fun talking to you about this today. So, well, likewise. Yeah. You, let's you know let's take too. off. Let's cool. take off. So, tell us, tell us about your background, Mark, and how you really got here doing what you're doing. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, how far back do you want me to go? I, I, I can give you the abridged version. There you um, go. You know, starting maybe in, chapter 26 if my career is a book and I'll, that would put me about 2018 and so this is right after a 12 year stint in e-commerce online retail selling musical instruments and i've talked to you about that company before we can talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. it later um but i'll move on we did everything in-house there I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit and that ended after 12 years and i took some time off and I'm happy to talk about that too. But then, you know, it was on to the next thing. And, um, you know, I found a, a role as a chief product officer, chief operating officer uh, at a software as a service company. And it was an interim role, it took me about 10 months to find that role, I checked all the boxes. And it had the potential to be long term. And after the 90 days, it's like, you know, this is just not a good cultural fit. And, you know, it was really disappointing. And so here I am after a 10 month job search, like starting over yet again, after being in yeah. one place for 12 years. Um, and that was an interesting period. I had to kind of scrape myself off the pavement, you know, for uh, a few weeks and then just kind of get back, get back up and at it again, going out to the networking groups and, um, and all that. And I was up for another like chief operating officer, chief product officer position in the software company right around the time this pandemic started i think this is just before i met you and that just evaporated you know with yeah. the pand pandemic and so here i am and I'm like what do i do now and for that role was an eos shop and they were they were do i need to spell out what eos is for the for the audience no the they probably know yeah, yeah the entrepreneurial operating system and I had read the book Traction and Rocket Fuel and taken the Colby and taken the online courses and everything. I'm like, yeah, I'm an integrator. That's what I've been doing, you know, for at least 15 years. Uh, but then, you know, I, I hit, that was fresh on my mind. And, you know, as soon as the pandemic started, the, the, the possibility of working remotely and, you know, having clients in other cities and, and so forth became possible. So I'm like, why don't I just hang up shingle as a, us integrator fractional ceo i had heard about this fractional thing right about five years ago and it, at the time i knew two guys in chicago uh who were doing it and you yeah. had to go drive out an hour away to find out what this fractional thing was if you were interested and i was interested um now of course everybody's a fractional and, mm -hmm. and as well as a coach which is the other thing i do I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute but um i started the fractional thing and i got my first you know few clients and mostly word of mouth networking and kind of figured out how it works and what I'm doing. And, you know, I worked with EOS, um, which is a great framework, but a lot of the, the companies who say they're using EOS, you know, they, they, 
they're self-implementers, about 10%, hundreds of thousands of companies use EOS and about 10% at best use an implementer. So, you know, they're kind of half in, half out. You become yeah. the implementer as the integrator. That's a whole other story I can talk about. But um, so the search for a framework was something that another framework or my own framework was part of the deal. And then in the process, um, somebody came up to me and an old, an old uh, employee and said, you know, hey, do you do any coaching? Because uh, I was, you know, appreciated you uh, back at the old company when you were in a leadership position and I could use some coaching. And I'm like, you know, I've been thinking about that. People had suggested, you know, you'd be a good coach or, you know, I did a lot of coaching, you know, when I was at this company for 12 years, you know, you bring people up, you, you mentor yeah. them, you coach them. We hired a lot from within, we grew from within. So I'm like, yeah, let's give it a shot. Let's do it. And so that became my first coaching client. And I realized I really enjoy coaching and it's been very satisfying. And along the line, so that's one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching. I, I'm like, EOS is great, but um, it's kind of missing some of the people elements. And fortunately, I found this, this new framework. It's called System and Soul that spun out of EOS for that very reason. So one of the, one of the founders of System and Soul was an expert EOS implementer for 11 years, Chris White. I don't know if you know him. He's a great guy. You, you two would like each other. Uh, great storyteller. And, you know, he had a lot of success. He's a Gina Wickman protege. Um, but he and a client spun out after, you know, a while and said, look, we need more. It's uh, EOS is great on process. You know, it's great on structure systems. But the people side, like, the, you know, that's at least half the of any organization is the people side. So that's the soul side of the system and soul and you know, mm -hmm. trying to bring more balance to that. And I discovered this framework. I really love it. I think you get everything that you get from EOS plus. I think they've made some refinements to the process side of things, but you also get the people side, leadership development, you know, cultural engineering, um, really strategic road mapping uh, that's a little bit more robust and, and purposeful as far as I'm concerned. Uh, compared to us, but you know, I'm not here to tout a system. Like these are all tools for me Yeah, for yeah. tools in the kits. I can do either right now. I've got an EOS client as a fractional. So I, I do a little bit of, uh, I do, I kind of got like at least two or three prongs to my, it's sort of a portfolio career at the moment The the fractional COO work, the one-on-one -on -one coaching, and then the, uh, the system and soul is is more of a leadership team coaching so it's a founder ceo typically and their leadership team okay so long answer no no it's good though it's good though kind of okay because the thing that you have got that many coaches don't have is you've got a plethora of experience across different industries you you've uh, you know you've walked the walk uh more than a lot of people have studied the walk so it's it's uh, very applicable when you're helping people, I think, to be able to teach them, coach them, help them, lead them from a point of, I've been here. I can yeah. feel what you feel right now because I've felt that. And this is this is what I think we should do from here or maybe you want to consider. Right, right, right. And this is something that I, I talked to a, an EOS implementer recently, and he said, you know, frankly, um, you don't have to necessarily – have done anything except pay the you know forty thousand sixty thousand dollars to get the license and you know to be an EOS implementer that I mean there's a lot of really great ones out there mm -hmm. no question about it but um you know just having the the certification doesn't necessarily mean anything you know um and so uh yeah practical experience helps a lot and and I can draw a lot from my experience um in e-commerce so you know talk about that uh this place where, where I was for 12 years. So it, it was a, uh, an e-commerce company and online retail. We sold musical instruments and we built everything in-house. So we did, we did product in-house. We built the software in-house, the front end and the back end. We did digital marketing in-house. So we did, you know, SEO, SEM, social, email, video, YouTube, everything in-house and all the engineering and analytics and so forth. So, um, you know, it was really a, a breadth of talent under one roof. We had a call center and the company had, you know, plateaued 
after you know maybe 10 years uh, for about four or five years at you know 40 to 50 million mark and really was lacking structure so I came in originally as a business process analyst and then I went into kind of inherited the marketing team and did some creative direction because I had some writing background and and um, you know I worked for some startups previously and and uh, anyway I took that on and and then the you know operations guy I got fired and I took that on so then suddenly like you know a lot of the company is is reporting to me and and the main thing that was missing was was structure and process so you know we've talked about this a little bit before so implemented agile scrum was the first scrum master a lot of DIY hands-on then you you find somebody else to do it better than you and you hand it off you build a team around it and you move on to the next thing and after a while we had the you know good leadership team in place and we mm-hmm. grew we saw a lot of growth during that time, the time that we were there, a lot of innovation, um, yeah. and you know, about a hundred million in growth uh, over ten years. And I'm always looking for what's next, and yeah. and what, um, and for growth. And and so, I mean, this is where I learned about operations, though. This is where I learned to love operations to the extent that I can say I really love operations. I think I do. It's about building things. It's about connecting the dots. And it's at least half about the people, you know, working with people, mm-hmm. figuring out how to align everybody, figuring out how to grow people and help them, you know, reach their career goals without leaving the company if possible. So we saw a yeah. lot of, you know, promote promotion from within as we identified people's strengths and talents and, you know, cultivated career paths for them. Yeah. As long as long as you're growing, you can do that, um, you know, rather than okay, I've gotten everything I can get from you and now it's time for me to move on to the next place. Um, so we're, we're able to maintain a lot of uh, talent that way. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Growth does allow you to give people great career paths. That's for sure. Right. And, and when you're, and, and challenging career paths too. Right. Good yeah. challenges. Right. Yeah. So uh, on that, on that journey and other ones, as you talking, you know, today we're talking about breaking through these plateaus when you're trying to help these companies grow and it's something you talk about on your, on your profile and LinkedIn and the things that you do, what are some of the plateaus that you saw in your experience in, in either that company, other companies you've been in where you go, okay, here's, here's some situational plateaus that I've walked in on. Sure. Well, that one was a lack of structure and process, which made it, um, it was impossible to really um, prioritize work. Okay. Um, and in particular, it was tricky in particular because the founder CEO had, who had built the original e-commerce um, tech stack and infrastructure, the website um, had handed it off to chief engineer who changed everything. And the two of them were no longer speaking to each other. So, um, you know, the first guy had to find out what the second guy knew before he let him go. And that was my job. Like, it, unbeknownst yeah. to me in the beginning but you know like facilitate that transition you know and uh in a smooth business transition um and keep everything running find out where everything is how it works and 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 then move on to the next thing and so um so that was one issue and then uh, you know in no process no structures because that was a situation where like either the ceo tells you know the guy what to do and he does it or he doesn't do it and and yeah. and that that's no way to grow a company um, so implementing a process is one, um, something else that I've seen and is very common, especially with my fractional clients and some of the coaching clients is a founder CEO who is still wearing 16 hats and, and they're doing all this stuff that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and they can't, you know, they can't get out of being in the business to work on the business and so mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's an important distinction I, i'm always trying to emphasize i had a conversation with somebody about it today where you know she she's a sales acceleration um fractional uh cso she's great uh, she mm-hmm. was if you're listening you know who i'm talking about and uh she was saying and people have a hard time understanding you know working on the business versus working in the business like oh yeah to me, it seems obvious, but you know, like so many things, if, if it's the water you swim in, uh, it's going to seem obvious to you. But you know, really, really making that distinction clear, um, and that is something that I have really focused on. Where I'm like, okay, 
think about it. One, one metaphor, I, and I was trying this out on her because I'm like, yeah, it's really hard to communicate. But one metaphor I, I'm, I'm testing out here, you can tell me if this works for you, is, is sort of, you know, software development. So I've been pretty much in the software space my entire career in one way or another. And this idea of like, you got your production environment, right? That's, that's your day-to-day -day work, you know? That's where, you know, your job description, your roles and responsibilities, maybe you have a mission for that role or job function, um, and you're being held accountable for those things with KPIs. Mm -hmm. But then, but then if you, but then there's the, um, the development of our environment. So that's like where new software is being built. Like, you know, you, you roll something out and it's kind of crappy, you know, the features are, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't look very Definitely good. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that stuff just doesn't work. And you're so you're working on a dev, and you're usually it's going to be like a dev, you know, QA environment, then a staging environment. Then it gets integrated back into production. Well, like to me, like that that cycle, that build cycle, is really important for every business. And whether you're in software or not, you need to like separate out the working on the business from the working in the business the working in the business that's your day-to-day -day job the working on the business is how you scale your business and mm -hmm. and you need to carve out time for that you need to put it in its own cycle i like to put it in a sprint like a like an agile scrum sprint like a two-week sprint and so i have my own thoughts and theories about mm -hmm. these these work cycles i think that you know the, the daily work cycle the production work cycle is pretty pretty much it's a it's a day-to-day -day thing you know um then you got your weekly alignment cycle those are your you know one-on-ones with your team members if you're having them you should be having them if you're not you know your team meetings your leadership meetings mm -hmm. um and you know your l10 for eos and then also like a you need a build cycle i like a two-week cycle for that but a build cycle that's separate you know, because otherwise it doesn't get done. And, you know, here again, EOS works and it can work in that space. Um, I, even with EOS though, like on, in rocks, I like, I like to put them in its own sprint so we can talk about them separately outside of the L, L10 meeting um, and make sure that people are, are making progress, yeah. um, you know, between meetings and, and we're biting off bite-sized chunks that they can finish in that two week cycle blah, blah, blah. But you know, you're, you're building something and then you're, you're integrating that back into your production environment. So I, that, you know, to me that, I don't know if that works. Does that make sense to you as a, as a metaphor for in the business versus on the business? You know, it's a classic Michael Gerber from E-Myth Revisited. Yeah, distinction. it does. It does make sense. And, and, you know, I, I like your adaptation of using a uh, agile sprint or or what are you the scrum or the whole thing where you're talking about we have a yeah, sprint. cycle that we're going to finish a project because i think what happens with with eos and other ones when you talk about the rocks you know those are typically quarterly goals and even sometimes quarterly goals are too big for you to really to break them into the bite-sized pieces and right. what you often end up is like oh it rolls from one quarter to the other because we didn't significantly or didn't take the time to break it down into the bite-sized pieces that we can get done in these shorter time frames. Exactly. And, and, and they it, just lag. They just lag. That's one thing I like about uh, System and Soul is that we use OKRs. So we, we just call them quarterly objectives and we use OKRs. Have you used OKRs? Before? No, I have not. Explain objectives them. Key, it's objectives and key results. So, you know, it has its own long history. Andy Grove and Intel and Google, you know, made it famous. And measure what matters that's john door you know yep. um great book um and a website but it's it's so it's a goal setting methodology and it's really it's more art than science um but i think it works really well um not for an innovative organization like google you know whose all their products are you know they're all constantly innovating it makes sense for that to be part of their regular you know yes day to day and you know quarterly yearly um the way they do everything and measure things but but for the most of the businesses i work with small businesses this is how i do um that build cycle i'm talking about or like rocks it's like you create okrs these are your quarterly objectives and and the objective is really a goal that you've stated and the and the key results are measurable uh steps that if you 
if you do all these things, like five things, if you can say, yep, I did that. And they have, to, you know, they have to be things that you can say yes or no, that's done. Mm -hmm. Whether, whether that's, I practice five times a day for one hour a day, you know, playing the piano or something, or, you know, I finished this draft or I released this thing, or I, you know, if you check all the boxes, it you've met the objective. Now that's the key. If you check all the boxes and you still haven't met the objective, then you haven't defined the, the measurables or the objective um, correctly. So they kind of mm -hmm. work off each other, you know what I mean? And you start out maybe with an objective and it's like, wait, is that really what we want to do? Or is that really how we want to put it? Because, you know, how you word something makes a difference. And then you're looking at, okay, what are the measurable things that we can do um, that when we've done them, we know that we've met that objective. It means we yeah. don't have met that objective. Yeah. Cause that's the, that's the thing. I mean, we can lay out things with, with just without, with, if you don't have clear, start stop this is done that's done such points it's really hard to to do those kind of things but that's cool how you're you know breaking it down into the shorter cycles so that you can keep that momentum moving right i think in the plateauing companies and this is a kind of a lead into this is when you run into the plateauing companies what is happening is those those kind of things are not getting done Right. Because it, it build everything builds on e each other, you know, and you want it, yeah. you want small modular pieces that are reproducible and, you know, you want quick wins and all that, but they have to build towards something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're building some margin in, you know, with each cycle that, you know, it's like becomes the input to the next cycle. And they, they all, you know, they interact these different cycles, you know, they kind of stack on top of each other and inform each other, but you got to be building towards something. And, and you're always aligning. This is where, okay, system is so like, this is the thing that I'm passionate about is, is the roadmap. Um, and I love that system and soul has a roadmap because it's really becomes the one page um, strategy that, you know, it's the filter that you use to, to for all your decision-making and, and everything that you do, your objectives, your, you know, I need to align with that. Yeah. You know? And so that, um, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. yeah I we, I, it's yeah. funny you're saying this because we were just doing this in a meeting earlier this week. We were talking about that very thing. Uh, Kurt Anderson and I were like, you know, mm. listen, this is the objective of the business. This should help guide what we're doing because we right. we really, it keeps you so focused when you do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's... Go for it. <laughs> that's the thing that I get excited about. You know, I mean, the operation stuff, the cycles and the projects and planning, that's that's just that's the meat and the potatoes of it but you know the bigger picture is you know is starting with why the simon sinek thing um having a strategic purpose like everything starts with purpose because you know that's what motivates you and keeps you going you know through tough times and, yeah. and good times um you know peter drucker uh, said i love you know this quote he says um you know uh profit for a business is like air for a human being um, if you don't get enough of it, you're out of the game. But if you think your life is merely about breathing, you're really missing something. So nobody really cares about your profit. You know, nobody really cares about your profit margin. I mean, except for you. And and you know, you can incense some people, you know, and that might make them care about it more. But but ultimately, people want meaningful work. You know, there, yeah. there's this, and and that that's you know, they want to work towards something that matters and and something that's inspiring and that's what and people have a hard time with this because like well you know i just sell widgets you know and try to treat my customers well and you know, sell at a fair price you know what's the purpose in that well you gotta you gotta think about it but there's always a purpose it's like the ripple effect what about you know yeah what kind of impact is what kind of difference are you making in your customer's life and 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 the people whose lives they're touching or if it's b2b like think not only do you need to know your, your clients' businesses really well, but you need to know your clients' clients' businesses and your clients' clients' clients. You know, I mean, you, yeah. you need to, you need to keep thinking outward like that. Um, and you know, I there's a recent survey where 90% of professionals were saying they would sacrifice up to 23% of their lifetime earnings for work that is always meaningful. So think about that. that's like almost a quarter of their lifetime earnings. Yeah, and and big surprise, you know, they're, they're your most productive people, you know? And so this is like, you know, attracting and retaining talent is, you know, a huge thing for everybody. 
Um, and what, what what this survey says, and it's proved out in all sorts of other ways, other you know research, that your best employees, you know, money matters, but only to an extent. They'll take less money for work that is meaningful. So what is meaningful work, and how do you how do you create that? And to me, that's what this you know starting with why. So you're you're looking at you know what's your vision you know what's the what's your big hairy audacious goal like what's the impact you want to make on the on the on the world and by when and you know and why are you doing that because the you know your purpose is what keeps you going and and then you're looking at your core values you know and how do they align out you know through everything you do towards you know attaining that vision that you're trying to attain it needs to be something inspiring like the you know like kennedy's you know moon moonshot live that you know the yeah. very first literal moonshot like we're going to send a man to the moon by the end of the decade and bring him home safely like that was it and yeah. and and they did it and it was extremely inspiring you know for a whole nation so like a lot of people i'm finding don't think big enough either they're like well you know and that's been some of the fun of it is to get people to think bigger and then actually exceed their expectations that this is this has happened with coaching clients and I love it because they're, you know, I can think of one, for example, you know, who is like, you know, when we started was like, well, you know, um, I don't want to get too big, you know, and, and, and he was in a place where, um, you know, he has an, an agency and in a niche, uh, market mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe eight, eight people and been at it for, you know, seven, eight years and, you know, doing all right and kind of hitting, uh, like a million milestone, you know, million, million revenue. So still, you know, on the small side, but, um, you know, kind of feeling worn out and I'm not sure how long I want to do this. And, you know, it's a younger guy, like in his thirties. Yeah. And I'm, you know, so I always start with, well, where do you want to go? You know, like, mm -hmm. what do you, what, just forget it. Just, just what do you want to do? It's well, you know, ideally, you know, I have this vision, like I'd love to move back to the Pacific Northwest, like your territory, like, you know, buy a house on Vashon Island or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, by when, you know, in getting a young guy, you know, anybody really think five, 10 years ahead, that's, you know, it's like, it's hard enough to think, you know, about next year, but yeah. um, I don't know, you know, at some point, cause I might want to do something different. Okay. Well, let, let's just, let's just start with that. Okay. So, you know, that house is probably gonna cost you $5 million, <laughs> $6 million, whatever um, today in, in today's dollars. So, you know, let's say, you know, and I'm doing, I'm doing shorthand here, but you know, this is the stuff that you, you do all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, like, okay. So let's say you're you've got a $10 million business. It's an agency. Like it depends on the multiples and the timing yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But you know, maybe that nets you, I don't know, 20 million or something, you know, in a sale. I mean, you guys yeah. know all about it. That'll buy you a house on Vashon Island and, and some breathing room to do whatever you want to do next, you know? So yep. let's just start with that. A ten, You want a $10 million business, okay? Like, what's the time frame? Okay, let's just say five to 10 years. Okay, let's pick a number, 2030. Let's just pick 2030. Let's work backward from there. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you get there? And then, you know, that gets into, like, all this stuff about OKRs and, um, you know, smaller bits and... But the the larger piece, I, I, the larger piece is again about purpose, and and what mo it's not just about you, you know, it's about your employees. Like, how do you motivate your employees? They, you know, you need to give them an inspiring vision, uh, and a purpose, and 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 talk about impact, and then what is impact? It's it's making it, it's changing lives. That it, that's what it comes down to, changing people's lives, and. You know, when people talk about purpose, there's, you know, they're like, I, you know, I got to be Patagonia, you know, like I got to be changing the world, you know, like a huge environmental mission. Like that's one way to do it. And they, yeah. they, they walk the walk, you know, they, they, they put their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. um, they're a B Corp too. I don't know if you know about that, like uh, B Corp, it's a whole, do you know that, you know about B Corp? Yeah, yeah. I've heard of them. Whole, whole thing. But, um, but that's not the only way to do it. You know, just even treating your people well, like having a great culture, like that's yeah. one way to make an impact. And again, think about the ripple effect on their families and then on your clients, just thinking about all your stakeholders and um, and then really aligning that with your values and making sure you walk the walk and you've got to cultivate that stuff. Um, like it's like gardening. You got to water yeah. the, the, you know, yeah. the, the good stuff and you got to rip out the old stuff and, and 
toss it out. I mean, the bad yeah. stuff. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that leaders, when they're plateauing, they forget how much, how important it is to keep spreading the vision. Right. Because that vision is always pulling us forward, leading us there so we can see where we want to go. And if you stop communicating the vision, like you said, start out with your your strategic why, why are we doing this? Why we're, you know, how are we going to make an impact? How are we going to help our community, ourselves, our employees, all that. Mm -hmm. But once you stop as a leader doing that, because it, it almost, I, I really admire these companies that do it consistently every yeah. single day that really do it because they are the ones that you see, you know, you mentioned Google. They know mm -hmm. what they're doing every day. They know where they're trying to go every single day. Everybody's right. trying to trying to keep everybody rolling the same way. And it's and the companies that do that well, I think they mm -hmm. they have far fewer plateaus because we're always looking to the next hill because we just got right. to the top of this one. Exactly. But our our end goal kind of it's great and it's really pulling us, but it's continuing to move away from us just a little bit. As right. Yeah. Right. Right. And it, yeah, exactly. And then about it's like, you're never done. Like if you yeah. think you're done, then, then you probably you're are done. done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, it's, it, you know, we're talking about plateaus. What are some of the things that you see when you're coaching people that, that really, that you go. So if someone's listening today, and they're wondering, am I plateaued or not? What are some yeah. of the things that you see that would be common that they they would go, well, maybe I am. Yeah, you're well, you're 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 not growing uh, either in in revenue or profitability, or if you are, it's inconsistent. It's not a steady. It's not a steady line. It's a some up. There's some down. Yeah, and you're, yeah, that's one. Um, people are leaving, or you, you're you're you can't retain good people or you've had the same people forever and and you love them to death but you know in your in your heart and in your mind that you you're going to need other people if you're going to make this if you're going to get to where you want to go um if you keep you know having the same issues over and over again or the same conversations over and over again and and you don't feel like you're making any progress you've plateaued if you're still doing you know what you were doing i don't know five ten years ago like you've plateaued um those are some examples i'm trying to think what are some common ones that you see other others well i was just going to ask you how how long do you think it is before someone should say hey we've plateaued is it six months yeah. is it 90 days is it five years what do you think <laughs> well it kind of depends on your cash flow and 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 uh yeah yeah that's true right but uh I mean, five years, definitely like, you know, where, where I had, you, you won't see it necessarily. Uh, it, a lot of it depends on scale too. I think like, you know, if you're at 50 million and you go from 50 to 51 and 51 to 47 and 47 to 50 and 50 to 43, you know, like it's, it's, it, you know, it's okay. It, it's not until you hit 43 that you realize, okay, we're, we're definitely plateaued. Although, yeah. although to me, if you're not growing, consistently even if the you know the the revenue or the profitability may lag like a year or two but if you're not growing in some deliberate way like i know we we didn't we did we weren't as profitable this year as last year because we hired a bunch of great new people you know okay right so like you, you can't just look at the revenue numbers but you have to look at it strategically like if you're deliberately investing in the business yeah, that number, you know, your top line is going to go down, or your, you know, your bottom line is going to go down. Um, and, uh, but that, but at least you're making progress. But if that doesn't next year then lead to, you know, some kind of growth that, you know, shows up, I think, in the bottom line, then, you know, then something probably still isn't working. Either you didn't hire the right people or, you know, your strategy isn't working, yeah. um, you know, or you're, you're, you're not, you're not done yet. You're not, and, and again, you're never done until you're done and then it's over. And, and so I, to me, constant growth is is the thing. And, and, and I was thinking about this earlier, just like how you start by like making something or and then it really becomes more about how you make it. It's more like about the, the methodology than the thing itself, because that's the thing that you keep 
keeps building, you know, that keeps you going. It's the, it's the process. Um, that is a great point. It's how you do it in the process of doing it and getting really efficient and really good at doing it to continue to do it at scale and larger volumes and, and, and more efficiently. Exactly. And, and then, and then also thinking about like, how could we use the same process to do something else, you know, that is, mm -hmm. it brings in another source of revenue. And that's, you know, where I've seen, you know, a lot of light bulbs go off for people. It's like, you know, talk about, uh, clients, you know, where, um, you know, my, <laughs> my advice is always like, don't turn down like an opportunity to, to grow, you know, like this uh, young CEO is like, you know, well, we have an opportunity to do like, um, like trade packaging, you know, so it's something we haven't done before. And it's like, so we, we can't do that. It's like, why can't you do that? You know, like all the things involved in doing it, like you do most of those things. It's just like a different channel or a different medium, mm -hmm. you know, but, but like, is there any reason why you can't do it? I guess not. And now they're doing it, of course. And, and it's, it not only another source of revenue, but it, it's leading to other opportunities. So that's just, that's just an example. Um, and what matters more, I think, is the talent that you have on your team and, and the process that you use. Um, so are you going to say something? I no, no, I just, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you there. I'm agreeing with the talent you have on your team. I mean, I, I think you, you said it before a bit ago, you know, you have people leaving or have the right people, have the same people there forever, but yeah. those people aren't growing. I mean, yeah. you're the, I think as Bro. you get bigger, your team is what really is going to constrain you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, growth. I mean, I I've never been in a situation. I've never had a like a, sec, a successful transformation that didn't involve a change of personnel. I, it doesn't mean everybody. It, it's yeah. not like one hundred percent turnover. Like, and and you, you you try and save as many as possible, and it may be you know a new role. Um, you know, here again, like this is where we, you know, can get back to the frameworks of like, uh, you know, what makes the right person the right seat and do they align with your core values? That's, that's one thing, you know, if, if it's not a core values fit and here's the thing, the core values, you write them in such a way that it can be a filter, right? I mean, talk about core values, they should, you know, lead to more no's than yeses in a way. Um, it, they're, they're exclusive in some ways rather than, you know I mean? It's like, it's deciding who you want and who you don't. Yes. Um, and uh, I've worked with people to write core values to address issues that they, they consistently have, uh, but have failed to address. Um, this is one way to do that. So, for example, you know, people are afraid of conflict. And this is so common, right? People don't oh, yeah. know how to do conflict. Well, make that a core value and, and you write it in such a way like, you know, we 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 are all we try to be you know kind, but direct in, you know, in, in, in resolving problems together, you know, however you want to put it. But then when that comes up again and somebody's avoiding the issue, like you can point back to that and say, look, this is a core value of ours. Like either you're with us on that or you're not. Um, so that that's that's one thing. Um, but then there's also like kind of fitness for the role. Does it does it does it really fuel yeah. them? Is it really the right time for them? And can they make can they make an impact in the role? Um, can they grow with the role? I mean, you mentioned growth, like your employees aren't growing. Like as long as they're growing, that, that's, that's huge. Like growth mindset, like I'm all about growth mindset. I, I think I was about growth mindset before I even knew it was a thing. Yeah. You know, just like, just, I like to learn and that motivates me. And, and, and I think, um, I think, you know, you want people who are going to be able to grow with you and who are, who like to grow, who, mm -hmm. you know, who, who aren't just, well, I, I don't that I don't know how to do that. I've never done that before. Like, OK, well, then we're going to have to either you figure it out or we'll have to hire somebody else to do it. And then I'm not sure what you're going to do anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's the thing about scaling, too. I mean, when we're talking about these plateaus, there are certain points when what we did yesterday was perfectly fine. But over time, it's gotten to be more and more arduous to handle the scale that we're at, that we yeah. need to re do a complete reset on what we, what we do and start over with a dis different system, different process, whatever, just because we have to. And that's where I think a lot of companies get plateaued because you get people that are yeah. so resistant to system change that 
it just stops the stops the growth and they go, well, we need to hire more people. Well, you don't need to hire more people because pretty soon you find I've got rooms full of people, but we still have the same issue. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That that's, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, cause I'm trying to think like we grew like at this other company, you know, a hundred million dollars. And I think that was all like, we did agile scrum like that's, and that's what I love about the system. It's so flexible that it, it could grow and we never outgrew it. Um, but I do think there, there must be inflection points where it depends. I mean, you want, you want a system that's flexible and adaptable. Yeah. Scale, but there are some that break, you know? Uh, yes. Yes. But I think you, by, by using uh, the agile scrum methodology, methodology, you were able to continue pushing the, the, the boundaries of what are we going to do, reinventing what we're doing on a consistent basis yes, yeah. to stay ahead of that. And that's that's where you most companies, they go, oh, we haven't changed this forever because it works. We just don't even mess with it. Right, right. If it ain't And right. they're not sitting there looking at, well, that was fine yesterday. And like in e-commerce, it's a real common thing. Well, Five years ago, we might have done, you know, a hundred transactions a day. Now we're doing a thousand transactions a day or two thousand or five thousand. And you just the systems just can't do it, especially if you were doing it manual at one time and you know, you just can't anymore. Right, right. And and if yeah, and and what are you gonna do? Shut down the whole operation, you know, to make the the switch, right? So it's like mm -hmm. constant, you know, again, like, like to, to, Toyota, like Kaizen, you know, it's continuous improvement, constant yeah. innovation, um, continuous change. Like, again, you have to embrace that. I think in any industry, really, like yes. that, you know, the Googles, the software people, the intellectual property people, that's the status quo. It may be different in older industries, but here again, I think more and more in today's, you know, marketplace, you have to, adapt that mentality of how are we going to continually innovate and otherwise you're going to get you know either crushed from above or disrupted from below um you need to be thinking you need to embrace change and that that's that's very hard for a lot of people especially mm -hmm. you know companies have been around for a long time and that's that's why i guess change management consultants exist yeah but yeah. but i i feel like you know that's that's what we do too you know it's yes. just like well, we have to continue to do it because we have to help others do it. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So when you're talking about system and soul, you, you mentioned that. And so what really drew you into using this methodology? Yeah. Uh, well, I like it. I, I mentioned a little bit earlier because it, it has more of the people side of things to it. it, it it's robust in terms of tools that address human issues so you know it starts with this one page roadmap where you define your hedgehog concept you know that's from jim collins good to great mm -hmm. and you know your your why and your hag and your onlyness statement which is like you know you you define your sandbox or your playing field we're the only what like you know what do you do you know like it's, it seems obvious but it's it's it, you can niche it you know, like when you describe like what, what you guys do, like, it, you know, it could be, or for me, like, you know, like, how do I describe what I do as a coach? You know, like it, it, it every, cause everybody's a coach, you know, and, but, and then what's the differentiator, you know, it's like, yeah. first you, you define the playing space and then within that playing space, what's going to differentiate you. And then, you know, there's this whole cultural engineering piece, like where we're looking at, you know, what's that ideal culture that you want to build let's let's describe it you know and then let's go back to your core values and revisit those like and then what are some of the organizational habits that you could cultivate um that would help bring this to life and they all you know they go together and you know there's some good examples of that and you're know, like what core value i love from a client is um everybody makes the coffee you know and and that's a, a great one it's a statement and you could break it down into attributes, but like those attributes would be like, it's, it's a democratic organization. You know, there's, it's, it's not huge on hierarchy, like whether you're the CEO or the summer intern, you drink the last cup of coffee, you make the next pot, you know, like yeah. that says something about the culture. And yeah. then, you know, how do you take it out of the lunchroom and, and, you know, extrapolate that to everything else we do. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, like we, we, there's a personal roadmap. So for your employees, you can figure like what career roadmap, like here again, yeah. align, aligning 
career goals and aspirations with company goals? How do they fit together? Um, we, we do Patrick Lencioni stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can, it's, it's open source. That's the other thing. Um, so it, it's constantly borrowing and, and partnering with other organizations. So it's very dynamic, a lot of new tools. Um, coaches are inventing new tools and it's a very, it's a very collaborative coaching community. So sharing uh, tools with each other and um, like, oh, here's another one, like the, the six uh, dimensions of compensation. We were talking about that a little bit earlier, you know, this idea of giving up 23% of your lifetime earnings for work that is meaningful. What are the other ways that people get compensated? You know, psychological, yeah. spirit, spiritual, which is like meaning, um, physical, like, you know, having the flexibility to work from home or, you know, uh, take time off. Um, what else? I yeah. mean, there, there, there's others that, you know, and, and each person's a little bit different. Like their profile is yeah. going to look different. So you could throw as much money as you want at somebody. If that doesn't really, if that's not what moves them, they're like, no, man, I just, this work is boring, boring the hell out of me. Like I, yeah. Or, or, you know, um, it's, it's not going to make a difference. So, um, I like it that it, it's, it's holistic in that sense. You know, you got the system side and the soul side and they need to, you know, it's like a yin yang kind of thing. Like they, they both need to fit um, together, fit together and they, they speak to each other and, um, yeah. and it's a dynamic thing. It, it doesn't, it never stops you, like, here again. You, you never get it perfect but it's, it's something to strive for. So, and I like that mentality and it's, it's constantly evolving too. So it kind of mm -hmm. fits it. it, it, it well, you can continue it helping the, helping your clients move forward in different ways, because as soon as you think you've got one master, one thing we've addressed, there's something else that crops up because it just, it's a, like you said, it's a continuous process. And exactly. It grows with you. It, it can grow with you as yeah. your business grows because your, your, your needs will change and evolve. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Mark, it's been incredible talking to you again and catching you up on this and just talking to you about breaking through these business plateaus, getting your feedback on how you're helping clients, learn a bit more about uh, system and soul. That's that's cool to see what you're doing there and how that integrates more of the people, the really the impact, the uh, all with the performance of the organization and some of right. the other things we see uh, across the board. But um, what's the best way if someone wants to reach out and talk to you to get a hold of you? Thanks. And thanks for asking. Um, you know, I think LinkedIn is best. Um, you know, you can find me, um, uh, just my name, Mark yep. Spermenti on LinkedIn. And uh, I've got a website too. Uh, it's vividpathconsulting.com. Uh, it's, it needs an overhaul. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too proud of it right now. You can come see it. You can visit me there, but the best way to do it, I think is connect with me on LinkedIn and I'm, uh, I'm open. So just reach out, connect, All right. uh, send a connection request and I will respond. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Mark, thanks so much for stopping by today. And as always dropping your enlightening knowledge with us and really helping us understand more about, you know, how you're helping people break through these plateaus in their business and really engage people better and, and build better organizations. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, thanks for having me. And I hope, I hope uh, the listeners get something out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I just want to say that thanks for the comment. We had a couple of comments in here. Thanks for dropping those comments. And those of you that came in late, go back to the beginning because Mark shared some really important golden nuggets from the beginning. Listen to the whole thing. We appreciate you, even if you did not drop a comment, because we know we're out there. And I'm so grateful to have a guest like Mark today. We will be back again next week, everyone. Hang out with me, Mark, when we're offline and we'll wrap up. Awesome. Thanks, Damon. Great talking.